Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another lecture for uh, the Good Samaritan University uh, virtual classes. I'm Kimon Bekelis. I'm the director of the Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center on Long Island uh, and uh, the director of the Stroke Program here at Good Samaritan Hospital. I know a lot of you um, have, uh, have attended our uh, in-person lectures over the years. Uh, recent events uh, have, have, have made us uh, really switch gears and go into more virtual, but we're still dedicated on the mission of uh, educating everybody and getting the word out. Uh, a lot of you know that stroke is uh, very near and dear to my heart, uh, and we really uh, want to continue to uh, educate you on the latest and greatest when it comes to stroke. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about prevention of stroke and treatment of this disease. These are my disclosures. Nothing of what I'm going to talk about has to do uh, with uh, any financial interests. Uh, these are just uh, research uh, uh, funds that I'm receiving. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about what really is ischemic stroke. There's two types of stroke, uh, the ischemic stroke and the hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic means the blood is not getting enough oxygen. Uh, the, the brain is not getting enough oxygen. And that happens when there's a blockage in the blood flow and the blood cannot make it to the appropriate place in the brain. Uh, and, and this is a nice schematic here where you can see, uh, and I'm pointing out there, uh, the blockage in the blood vessel. Now, the most important thing when it comes to stroke is reacting uh, to the symptoms as fast as possible. I always tell people, you know, we're glorified plumbers, we're at the end of the line, uh, and we're going to open a blood vessel when somebody comes to us with a blocked artery that ca that's causing a stroke. The most important component, though, of, of this line is the, the first uh, recognition, identification, and obviously activation uh, of uh, emergency medical services. And, and I guess the most important component of my lecture would be um, giving you this message. You have to spot a stroke FAST. And FAST is an acronym that stands for face, arm, speech. Uh, it's time to call 911. So if you have a deficit uh, in any of these components, or you see somebody that's having a deficit in any of these components, you have to act fast, you have to activate uh, the emergency medical services so that you're triaged to the appropriate facility. Face stands for face drooping, arm stands for arm weakness, and speech stands for speech difficulty. Again, any of the above, it's time to call 911. There's other symptoms of stroke as, as we're getting more and more sophisticated in our recognition and treatment of this disease. And uh, however, it's, those are uh, relatively difficult to just be attributed to a stroke. It's good to know that strokes can present with numbness, confusion, blur of vision, loss of balance, or really a headache. Uh, but the, 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 the big message is recognize face problems, arm problems, or leg problems, or speech problems. Now, obviously, you know, we, we care about stroke uh, because it's becoming uh, really uh, this, this we're seeing more and more uh, strokes across the world and, and in particular uh, in North America. Uh, you know, as the years are going by and we're approaching 2025, we will be seeing more than a million strokes per year in North America. And this is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, strokes. And the reason for that is, is that our lifestyle uh, is really uh, resulting in a lot of risk factors that eventually uh, can cause a stroke. So some numbers that are really staggering is that one in six people will have a stroke in their lifetime. And um, from the 15 million people that will experience a stroke every year worldwide, six million will not survive. And if you flip that statistic a little bit, every six seconds someone dies from a stroke worldwide. So really a very staggering disease. And for, the, for a very long time, we didn't have a lot of good treatment options when it came to stroke. And I always like to show this slide because there's a lot of um, uh, publicity and there's a, there's a lot of uh, understanding a, uh, about breast cancer in women. And, and this shows you how many uh, women die from breast cancer as opposed to women that die from stroke every year. You see there's a tremendously, m m uh, there's, there's a lot more women that die from, from, uh, from stroke, yet we don't have a lot of awareness. We don't have a lot of information out there. And the reason was that in the past, we didn't have a lot of good treatment options. So why talk about something where you know treatments are limited? Nowadays, this has changed. Again, this shows you a little bit of the distribution of stroke across the United States uh, for adults over the age of 35. You see uh, the distribution in what we call the stroke belt in, in, in the um, 
southern uh, east more United States, uh, where you know environmental factors really are contributing, uh, or or uh, comorbidities really are contributing to these um, to, to to this high incidence of stroke. And what comorbidities are we talking about? And and you can see here uh, across races that that down in that part of the United States, you're seeing kind of these heat maps. You see that you have more hypertension, more diabetes, and more smoking across really uh, races. And, and, and that's where you see a tremendous impact of stroke. Uh, and we call that part of the United States the stroke belt. Um, now, what are these risk factors that I just spoke about? Uh, this is what we call the ABCDE of stroke. Uh, blood pressure uh, is important. Obviously, our goal for blood pressure can vary. This is a general uh, direction that it should be below 130 systolic. But again, you know, these are general directions. I would advise you, if you have any of the above risk factors, follow the directions of your primary care provider. They know w to what level they should regulate those uh, comorbidities so that, uh, you're not, uh, so that you're not at risk for stroke. As I said, generally 130 or less than 130 for blood pressure. Cholesterol needs to be treated appropriately uh, and aggressively. Cigarette smoking is a big one. Um, cigarette smoking contributes tremendously to cardiovascular disease and stroke, and very aggressively we should uh, try uh, to uh, uh, quit smoking. Um, uh, di uh, diabetes is very important. Uh, we need to tightly regulate diabetes. Diabetes is a very important risk factor for stroke and cardiovascular disease, and that goes a little bit hand in hand with, with weight, Obesity obviously can contribute to stroke uh, and uh, diet. And last but not least, exercise. Exercise is important. You'll see um, that they, they're setting some goals uh, here on the slide. It says perform over 150 minutes uh, per week or uh, uh, of, of, of intense or more than 70, uh, of moderate exercise rather, sorry, or more than 75 minutes per week of vigorous physical activity. Now these are obviously some very good goals to have, but not all of us are gonna do that much exercise. The important message I have to give to you is do as much exercise as you can do. Um, every little bit helps, and that's very important in, in our general cardiovascular health and obviously stroke prevention. Uh, I, I, I started from B just because aspirin, which was A in this slide, has been um, had a lot of research on this topic about whether aspirin if you haven't had a stroke before, what we call primary prevention stroke or cardiovascular disease, if you haven't had a stroke before in the past, uh, physicians used to recommend aspirin in, in, in those folks over 55 years old. Nowadays, that might not be necessarily true, and our recommendations for aspirin have been modified based on research, uh, research evidence uh, that are demonstrating that some particular group of patients will, will really benefit from aspirin, but some will really not. And so... Uh, be cautious on the, on the aspirin and, and obviously consult with your doctor above all before uh, making any changes or recommendations. Now this is a way that was created by the National Stroke Association, the American Heart Association, uh, to really classify uh, your stroke risk. And, and the, this takes into account these risk factors we spoke about uh, and, and educates you on what category you belong to. Uh, and one important thing here uh, to consider uh, is that not one risk factor by itself is important. It's a, the combination of those risk factors, and, and those can put you in a high risk or low risk uh, category. Uh, another risk factor here that you might m see that I didn't mention before is atrial fibrillation. That, that is extremely common. Some of you might have that disease. That's a disease typically in uh, the older population, and it it really uh, is an abnormal heart rhythm. The heart doesn't pump uh, as, as efficiently. You have blood stagnating inside the heart that can form a clot and the heart can pump it into the brain, cause a blockage and a stroke. When you have that condition, frequently you are placed on blood thinners by your uh, physician and those are important to be, uh, uh, to, to be taken in the, in, the, in the prescribed way because if you're not therapeutic on your blood thinners, you might have you might develop a clot and have a stroke, especially when you have that risk factor. This slide is very detailed, and it's not meant to be um, uh, to be obviously uh, um, uh, educational. But I just wanted to show you how how many things we can do to prevent a stroke after you've had an initial stroke uh, already. Uh, and these are all the several categories of of why you might have had a stroke. For example, because you have 
uh, atherosclerosis inside the brain or because you have a clot from the heart or small vessel disease or you might not have a, a known etiology but we categorize patients based on their risk factors based on how the stroke happened and then generally if you see the common denominator here in the treatment is you will be getting some sort of modification of those risk factors but above all we will be giving you some sort of antiplatelet or uh, anticoagulation to make your blood thinner and to prevent uh, another stroke from happening. So you see a lot of these categories have aspirin as a, a treatment option. Uh, this is a common theme that I like to return to, and that's time is brain. Very important, the quicker you identify the stroke symptoms, the quicker you'll respond, and, and the higher the chance of full recovery uh, or uh, uh, a life uh, without disability. So again, time is brain, act fast. What treatments do we have for a stroke? As I said, you know, my, the first part of my lecture had to do with prevention of stroke, right? Um, so, so these are all the things that we can do to prevent a stroke from happening if you've never had a stroke or to prevent a second stroke from happening. Unfortunately, despite our best efforts, strokes still will happen, and, and the way we treat them is really paramount in ensuring that these patients uh, make it out of the hospital without any disabilities. So we have two treatments. The first one is medical. It involves a medication called IVTPA. That's a clot busting medicine. We give it through the IV and our goal is, sorry for that, our goal is for um, our patients to uh, take this medication when they show up to the, in the emergency room within four and a half hours of symptom onset and that medication typically breaks down the clot, opens up the blood vessel. Now this is a great treatment. It's just that the time window for this treatment is very short and its effectiveness is m better in smaller strokes. In more severe, serious strokes, its effectiveness is limited. And because of that, we had very limited tools for the longest time to treat stroke. Now, things have changed over the last five years with the introduction of mechanical thrombectomy. Mechanical thrombectomy is an endovascular procedure, which means a procedure we do through the by going in the artery in the leg or the artery on your wrist uh, and we navigate our catheters and wires all the way inside the brain and pull those blood clots out mechanically so we go fishing for a blood clot pr pretty much and 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 take it out uh, of the body and in mechanical thrombectomy and ivtpa the clot busting medicine are not necessarily mutually exclusive in the brain ideally somebody should receive ivtpa and then receive mechanical thrombectomy as, as most of these trials have shown us. And so the introduction of this procedure really changed the outlook of stroke and stroke care across the United States so and the world, frankly. So you see that zero to four and a half hours was the window we had when we only had IVTPA. After the first trials on mechanical thrombectomy, that window was pushed out to six hours. And most recent evidence in the last year, year and a half, have pushed this window all the way to 24 hours so really stroke is an emergency up to 24 hours after symptom onset because really we have tools that we can change the outlook of this disease all the way out to 24 hours really revolutionary uh, things that when it comes to uh, to stroke care and this is another important number that kind of shows you how impactful these treatments are how impactful mechanical thrombectomy is you really need to treat three patients with mechanical thrombectomy that are having a stroke, obviously, to achieve one patient with functional independence. Whereas the equivalent to get one patient with a good outcome, for example, in somebody who's having a, uh, a heart attack, you need to give aspirin to 42 patients to get one good outcome. See, we, we give aspirin to somebody who's having a heart attack without even thinking about it, and, but it takes a lot of people, a lot of treatments to get one good outcome that comes to show you how much more impactful the treatment is uh, for stroke. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples that, that show you how things can change in a split second and, and, and get patients that would have zero options in the past now to health very, very quickly if these patients are coming to the appropriate center. And, and, in, in, uh, uh, and uh, as I'm going to argue later, this center would be Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center, the only comprehensive stroke center in the South Shore of Long Island. Uh, so this is a 36-year-old female presenting to us five hours after the stroke symptoms started. Again, she's very young to be having a stroke, yet never think that because somebody's younger, they cannot have a stroke. More uncommon, but it can happen. And you see on the top of the screen, you have all these 
uh, weird looking uh, CAT scans. And these are, these are maps of the brain that show you whether there's still tissue of the brain that you can salvage. They tell you whether there's still part of the brain that's alive. Uh, and so they're called CT perfusion. This is what allows us to intervene in these patients, identify who has salvageable, salvageable tissue, and open the blood vessel and bring them back to a healthy living. In this, in this girl, it was obvious for us that there was, there was still tissue that we could salvage. And at the bottom part of the screen, you can see the two images before and after uh, the blockage uh, uh, was relieved, and now the brain was receiving um, was receiving blood. Now you see her NIH stroke scale. This number at the top was 22. That's that's a scale that shows us how severe a stroke is. Everything over six is really a serious stroke. In her case, it was really serious, and and this intervention really changed her life. She left the hospital the next day. Had she not been able to be at Good Sam at the right time, and had she not received treatment she would probably uh, uh, spend uh, a life of disability. And, and she, she was only 36, so imagine the, the impact of, of, this, uh, of this disease for this patient and the impact of the intervention. Again, you know, as I said, no age is immune to stroke, and that applies to the older population. So this lady was 92, functionally independent before, and presented with a severe stroke Again, the left side of the brain, she wasn't able to talk. She wasn't able to move on the right-hand side. Again, we opened, uh, the, uh, we opened the, blood, the blood vessel. She recovered fully. You would say, well, why would, you, uh, why would you operate on somebody who's older? Really, this is a very uh, minimally invasive procedure. It's done with local anesthesia. And if you're functionally independent before the procedure, uh, there's, a, there's a good chance you'll be after. And so our goal is really to change the outlook of this disease. And, and age is not important when it comes to that. Uh, another patient here, a uh, little smaller images, if you can see them, 67 years old. Uh, again, you see the right side of the brain is starving for oxygen, uh, but, but it's still alive. So this is a good patient to intervene and, uh, and, and change the outcome uh, of the disease. On the bottom right-hand side, you see what a clot looks like once you remove it from the body. Uh, you know, it's several pieces here, but, but the way mechanical thrombectomy works, uh, it, it, it typically involves us deploying a stent inside the brain and using a combination of suction and the stent acting as a fishnet to remove the clot out of the body. And this is exactly uh, what you uh, see here. Uh, this was a video that's not gonna play really, but, but it shows you how the patient immediately improved on the angio room table. Uh, and and that's that's key because that's really what motivates us to get out, get up out of bed in the middle of the night to go in the hospital and and really um, intervene on these patients. So 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 this lady uh, could not move the left side as I showed you before, and now all of a sudden after pulling the clot out, she starts moving both sides. When that happens, obviously, it stimulates the whole team um, to keep going. Now by treating stroke, a lot of times we will encounter. Um, the reasons for, for why a stroke is happening. And we can treat those not only medical, as I showed you before, with the blood thinners or the aspirin, the Plavix, the Coumadin, um, but we can also treat them surgically if needed. Uh, and this is the case of, for example, carotid plaque development, carotid atherosclerosis, and a blockage in the carotid artery that if dislodged from the, from the neck can make it into the brain and cause a stroke. Uh, and in this case, uh, um, our preferred treatment in this case was an endor, uh, was was a carotid artery stent, meaning we went in through the groin, and ballooned open this blockage, then placed the stent. You can see the difference from the left hand side and the right hand side how much bigger the vet blood vessel has become, and and this person was having was having TIAs and strokes. And a lot of you, I'm sure, this is a good segue to to. That's a common question I get. You know, what's the difference between a TIA and a stroke? A TIA TIA stands for transient ischemic attack, and it's really a blockage in a small blood vessel that leads, um, obviously, to ischemia or lack of blood flow to the brain and eventual stroke symptoms. Now, the body is able to break down that clot sometimes by itself, and because of that, there's renewed flow into the brain, and so the symptoms resolve. So TIA is really uh, a stroke that almost happened, but the body was able to prevent it. Uh, but the reason why a TIA is happening is still there, and so folks that have had a TIA are at very high risk of stroke, especially uh, around the couple of months after uh, a TIA uh, happens. So that's all about ischemic stroke or the type of stroke where there's no blood flow into the brain. 
The other type of stroke, less common, but to some extent more catastrophic, is the hemorrhagic stroke, the stroke where you have too much blood in the brain, you have bleeding inside the brain. And that can happen for multiple different reasons. It can happen because of high blood pressure. It can happen because of several other diseases. One of the most preventable um, uh, causes of, of hemorrhagic stroke is brain aneurysms. And a brain aneurysm is a, a, a blister on the side of a blood vessel, a little, a little balloon on the side of the blood vessel, a soft spot that allows, um, that, that can potentially rupture and, and cause hemorrhage or bleeding inside the brain. And it's a really uh, can be catastrophic if it ruptures. And, and so half of the patients, when a brain aneurysm ruptures, they die right away. From those that survive, only a third will make it out of the hospital without any issue. So really, we've got to get ahead of a brain aneurysm before it ruptures and try to treat it and, and, uh, and uh, change the outcome. Uh, and, and this is a public service announcement uh, from the Lisa Cole Grossi Foundation uh, that we're uh, a foundation we're working very closely with, um, but which is not going to play during this um, this uh, uh, live uh, lecture. But I encourage you to go to their website and uh, really look at the look at it, and it it really sends the message of uh, how devastating and sudden uh, a rupture of a brain aneurysm can be. So so never. Um, the message is if, if you know that you have a brain aneurysm, go get checked out, see if you need treatment, or if you don't, but you do develop symptoms such as headaches uh, that are of new onset, dizziness, uh, blurry vision, things like that, go get checked out. Uh, it can mean the difference between life and death. Uh, and I'll tell you why treatment for brain aneurysms these days is, is so simple. So these are the treatment options that historically we've had for brain aneurysms. On, on the left-hand side, you see what we call clipping of a brain aneurysm that involves a craniotomy or removal of part of the skull, and then we go deep inside the brain and put a clip at the neck of the aneurysm. That's uh, a great treatment option. Uh, however, it involves us doing a craniotomy, going inside the brain. It's not minimally invasive, obviously. On the right-hand side, you see what we do the majority of the times these days. We go in through the groin, we navigate our catheters and wires, and we either place coils inside uh, the sac to clot off the aneurysm, or we place stents to divert the flow away from the aneurysm and allow the aneurysm to clot off naturally and heal. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how we treated aneurysms after and before they ruptured. Uh, and, 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 and I think, I think it will be really impactful to see the stuff that we can do through the groin these days. So this is a young, young lady, 27 years old, uh, presents with a ruptured brain aneurysm. Again, she, she was having the worst headache of her life. She called EMS. The initial response was that you're young and you're just having a headache. But really, be your own f best advocate. And if you're thinking that this is the worst headache you've ever had, if you're thinking this is different, um, insist that you go to the hospital. And this is what changed her life, uh, that this is what saved her life, really. So in her case, she had a tiny, tiny aneurysm that you I'm pointing at it. I'm not sure if you can see it through the live stream, uh, but uh, it, it's sitting right at the edge of the carotid artery inside the brain. And then after we place the coils, you don't see the aneurysm anymore. And it uh, comes to show you how uh, amazing the engineering is that, that we have these days uh, that we're able, this is a one millimeter aneurysm, so one millimeter sphere, a tiny hair-like sphere that we're able to put a nano coil in to really change the outcome of this patient. In this case, much larger aneurysm, um, and you can see it's shaped like a heart, uh, and once we place the coils, again, in the bottom picture, you can see the aneurysm is not filling anymore. Now, an important uh, word of caution here, this lady presented with double vision. Double vision and a headache, um, if she ignored it, this was a very large aneurysm, most likely would have ruptured soon because it was pushing on the nerves that, was, that were controlling the movement of the eye. And so her um, insight into her condition and the fact that she went to the hospital, she came to a comprehensive stroke center, really is what, what uh, saved her life. Again, be your own best advocate when it comes to these diseases. They're silent, and when they do cause symptoms, it's always too late. And sometimes aneurysms have been have been coined the silent killer, but, but really, uh, really devastating disease. Now, there's another treatment. Again, somebody presents with the worst headache of their life. This is another aneurysm. You can see it fairly large on the leftmost picture. Then we place a stent that diverts the flow away from the aneurysm, and several months out, you see the right-hand picture where the aneurysm is gone. 
And the way it's gone is that it clotted off progressively, and then the body formed a ledge uh, underneath its neck to, to block it off and seal it off and heal the aneurysm. Um, really innovative treatments that are available uh, here at Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center. Really, there is no treatment for brain aneurysm that is not performed at Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center. And as I said, our center is the only comprehensive stroke center in the South Shore of Long Island that's certified uh, by the Joint Commission and also the only uh, center in, in, in Suffolk County that's certified both by the Joint Commission and the New York State Department of Health. Now, how do we function here as a system? Good Samaritan Hospital is at the center of this hub and spoke model uh, for stroke care. Uh, and is receiving patients not only for local from the community, but also patients travel here from St. Joseph's and St. Catharines of Siena, uh, in other CHS hospitals and affiliates, and outside of CHS from other facilities. Uh, since we're able to provide these comprehensive services, the whole system has been um, organized in a way to bring these patients to us as quickly as possible. And when it comes to where should a patient go? Obviously, if you're in, in the territory of St. Joseph's Hospital, for example, that's a great option because you're connected to a comprehensive stroke center if needed uh, very quickly. Now, if you're in the neighborhood of Good Samaritan Hospital, we are the only comprehensive stroke center in the South Shore of Long Island, so it's a no-brainer. If, if another hospital is within 15, 10, 15 minutes, um, uh, then there should be no reason why uh, a stroke patient should be going to another facility. Uh, and, and that's been, again and again, the case across the United States. That's been, um, that's been the, the trend for EMS. Now, the way we're able to provide those services at Good Samaritan Hospital uh, is because we have top-of-the-line infrastructure and personnel, some of the best in the country. Uh, the infrastructure, we have a, 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 a probably the newest pipeline angio suite on the island right now and the NeuroICU and step-down unit. Our NeuroICU, when it was developed three years ago, uh, was the first freestanding neuro ICU in Suffolk County and currently is the only one in uh, the South Shore of Long Island. Uh, uh, very talented personnel, however, is what really makes this program what it is. Uh, our nursing uh, is always who I mentioned first because they really are the, the, the beating heart of this program and uh, uh, over 65 new employees were included in this, in this uh, endeavor. So the neuro ICU and step-down nursing stroke neurology team, our telestroke team that's very unique and allows us to really bring the neurologist to the patient within seconds of showing up at Good Samaritan Hospital through remote connection, fairly unique service uh, that we're having. Uh, neurovascular surgery, uh, which is what I represent for the most part, I do a lot of the procedures here. Neuro ICU, the medical staff, uh, and uh, clinical uh, and critical care um, mid-level providers and technologists. And as I was saying before, we do a lot of research and we try to address the question of where patients should go several years in the uh, in the past before we had our program here at Good Samaritan Hospital and back then there were only primary stroke centers there were no comprehensive stroke centers and that's how we uh, provided evidence that eventually was used among other evidence to create policies for folks to go to their nearest primary stroke center now that we have uh, and this was published in JAMA several years ago and you can look it up obviously and this is a map from that paper that that actually mapped the entire United States and uh, demonstrated where patients should go if they were to develop a stroke. But most importantly, now we have comprehensive stroke centers. And as I said, if you're within 10 to 15 minutes of a comprehensive stroke center, you should be going to a comprehensive stroke center. And in the South Shore Long Island, your only choice is Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center. The way our program is working uh, is uh, based on four pillars. Uh, we're based on education, clinical care, quality improvement, and research. And every component for us is very important because it makes sure that we get the best outcome for you every single time. Um, clinical care is a lot of what I talked about. Education, this is part of education. Uh, we do a lot of research that I showed you very small component of, but quality improvement is really what I want to talk about. And quality improvement is very important to us. When you show up in our emergency room with a stroke or stroke-like symptoms, um, we are obviously trying to be perfect every time. However, I'm sure there's going to be uh, cases where there's going to be issues. Those are being reviewed daily. So, so if we're uh, we're being judged by the Joint Commission on several times of response and and interventions, and and if any of that falls out of the national standards, out of the benchmarks, those cases are reviewed, and the involved uh, 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 parties are really. Uh, uh, being investigated about you know what went wrong and we're trying to change the system every time to ensure that 
that doesn't happen the next time. So again, as I said, quality improvement, tremendous. Um, uh, one of our one of our very important pillars, uh, and uh, you know that's led by our quality improvement team and and our stroke coordinator, Karen Antaki. We are out there and we're trying to spread the message as much as possible. Uh, we're on radio, uh, uh, print, uh, TV, and we're trying to educate. As I said, what we do on the on the back end is really minor when you consider uh, all the things that uh, are being done on the front end. And the most important thing is identifying stroke. That's why we're out there. That's why we're talking to you today uh, is because we want you to be your best advocate. We want you to diagnose your stroke, get to the appropriate facility as quickly as possible. That being said, we support survivors. We've been supporting uh, the National Stroke Association, later on American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, WALK, since 2017 for the last three years. Uh, with the sponsorship and, and with our participation. It's key to support survivors uh, when it comes to stroke. And, and we also have a very unique support group that's, that's uh, 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 sponsored and, and, uh, and, and supported also by the Lisa Colagrossi Foundation that I mentioned before, uh, a, a one of the pioneers in, in uh, brain aneurysm education, research, and awareness. And, and so what we're doing in our support group is really trying to engage patients, our patients and other doctors' patients when it comes to stroke, uh, try to help them cope with everyday life and, and also uh, support them in the process and in the healing uh, that, that really never stops. Uh, for our hard work, uh, this, these teams that, that, uh, that, that we have here have been recognized in multiple forums. Uh, and I think our most, most prized recognition was being recognized as a comprehensive stroke center, which is the highest uh, level of recognition for stroke care uh, in the United States. Uh, we're in social media, so obviously look us up. We're out there. We're trying to promote uh, uh, awareness and get the word out. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the most important thing, as I said before, is what you guys do is really what's going to determine if you're going to have a good outcome or not. The quicker you go to the hospital, the quicker you recognize a stroke, the quicker you come to a comprehensive stroke center like Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, the higher the chance of you to have a full recovery. And, and with that, I want to I wanna, uh, thank you and direct you for more information to our webpage, uh, which is www.strokecenterlongisland.org. Stroke uh, again, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you.